teach a course in water law this fall on the same principle that I teach every new course. If you don't know a field, the only way to learn it is to teach it. I've also taught and worked extensively in the spectrum stuff and I've taught oil and gas and mineral law. And so given all of this background, I'm going to start with land. Um, and the reason I'm going to start with land is virtually every one of these fields essentially has to play off the land paradigm uh, with respect to the way in which it develops. And if you look at that, there are two of the fields, and, and I think Karen was right about this, which is minerals and spectrum, which are closer to land, and then water law, uh, which turns out to be the odd man out because that system cannot possibly work with respect to the same set of rules that use with land. Now, the first question that you have to ask when you're synthesizing property lot rights is just why is it that you want to create these things in the first place? And it turns out that the basic answer is really extraordinarily simple. If you don't have a system of property rights, everybody will get in everybody else's way. And essentially what you'll do is you'll have a melee. Uh, having decided that you need to structure the rights, there are basically two paradigms that you can start to use for their structure, each of which is an approximation, both of which will turn out to be corrected. The first of these paradigms is the paradigm of exclusivity. And what you say, as our friend Blackstone said with respect to land, the sole and despotic dominium over a given resource is given to an owner, which is good against everybody else in the universe. He's just not content to living with uh, the land. And that, of course, is the United States of the world. And that, of course, is the classic Roman conception of a right and rem, in which you stand in a certain relationship to the theme of a particular resource, and everybody else on the face of the globe has to forbear from entering into that particular research into you. Use it. And the reason we tend to like that particular pattern with respect to land is that it encourages investment which can now be returned over the long period of time. Uh, a lot of you have talked about the use it or lose it principle, and the question is whether you want to use it or to lose it, and I, that's a part. Uh, but I think, in effect, you probably want to lose it. And if you start going to land and you ask yourself whether or not there's any duty to develop land after you've acquired it by first possession, with respect to most systems, the answer to that question is clearly not. And the reason why you do this is because you assume that if the owner has the fee simple absolute in possession, that is, owns the land for an infinite duration, uh, that owner will be better able to make the temporal changes uh, that are required in the temporal judgments to see whether you invest now or invest later, harvest now or harvest later. And so long as the rest of the world is not going to be adversely impacted in their development decisions by what he or she does, uh, then you're going to start to leave it uh, generally speaking, to the single person to do it in the form uh, that that person turns to require. And what happens is the reason you do this is that there are two risks, and one of them was mentioned a great deal of time in this discussion, and the other was completely, I think, overlooked. Uh, the one that was mentioned was the risk that somehow or other somebody will sit on a resource of great value right, and uh, do nothing with it when it turns out that something should be done. Uh, but the other risk is that there'll be premature development of a particular resource before it turns out it's appropriate to put it into time. And so that at that point, the correct situation is since you've got a trade-off between the two things, is to ask whether or not some external party or the parties to the particular transaction are going to be better able to make a deal as to what goes on. And in dealing with that, we heard, in fact, in the last panel, uh, that somehow the use it or lose it seems to be appropriate in these mineral cases, seems to be less appropriate in the water cases, and there was a division of opinion with respect to the spectrum cases. And let me see if I could give my take on that as we start to go down. And the first thing is when you're dealing with the leases, you're not dealing with a question of what the positive law tells uh, a particular owner to do. You're dealing with the question of what a landlord tells a particular tenant to do. And at this particular point, you now have a contractual arrangement between the two of them. And the reason why a landlord may find it perfectly appropriate to put a use it or lose it condition on the land is that if the royalty stream dwindled, dwindles by virtue of the fact of non-use, the guy who doesn't use it is the tenant who gets the benefit of all the savings, the fellow who pays all the cost turns out to be the landlord who doesn't get the revenue. So the moment you start to create those kinds of split interests, the land, you have a kind of a built-in externality between the two parties, and the great achievement of most voluntary contracts, going back to the Roman law of usufrux, which I'll talk about more later, is that it allows the two parties to create by contract or by grant some kind of coordinated behavior in order to deal with the opportunism that necessarily arises when you have split ownership. The single greatest challenge with respect to every legal system is how, when you have divided ownership, 
ownership for efficiency reasons, it turns out that you don't allow the opportunism to take place by one party as against the other. And if you understand that opportunism is always a bilateral phenomenon in which each party can try to do into the other, you see why it is that these contract devices, as between the two parties, and in property cases, typically binding third parties who take by way of assignment, are absolutely critical in order to control that. So what happens is use it or lose it is not a principle of positive law with respect to the mineral cases. It's a principle essentially of contract. Now this then gets us to the second problem with use it or lose it by contract, is that you get two kinds of landlords. One of them is called the private owner and the other is called the government. And when you start to do with that, the private guy is probably going to have the right set of incentives, but only the Lord himself will know what the incentives are with respect to government agents when they start to lease or not to lease property, whether it's for minerals or for oil and gas or for everything else, because you don't have a unified profit-making enterprise there. What you do is you have a public choice nightmare of the first order because of all the clashing collective interests which will try to come to bear. So one famous illustration of this is when the Audubon Society Society decides to lease property. It is always going to allow people to drill, and what they say is, you know what, uh, we'll take a small royalty because we want you to put greater protections in. Perfectly efficient solution. When it comes to public lands, the Royal Audubon Society says, it's outrageous that anyone should be able to drill at all under these circumstances because it's a desecration of natural resources. Well, they're not the landlord at this particular point in time, so they start to play a very different game. And so one of the reasons why you see inefficiencies in this area is because you start to change the nature of the party who was involved in the particular transaction. Now, since we're talking about lose it or use it, or use it or lose it, uh, when you start coming to this particular situation, when you go to the other kinds of resources, when you're dealing with the spectrum, this is again closer to land uh, because exclusive rights with respect to development tend as the first approximation to be the most efficient system. And so therefore what we do is we either have grants or licenses, the difference turns out to be crucial, so that somebody can now use this thing uh, for a given period of time rating from three years out to essentially infinity. And if, in fact, you're going to start to create short-term transactions under these circumstances, you're going to have exactly the same kind of transitional difficulties that you have when you start creating private um, rights and property by creating a lease. The difference between this and the standard landlord-tenant situation is there's absolutely no gain whatsoever for having the government retain a reversionary interest with respect to the spectrum doesn't do anything in order to improve the way in which the thing starts to operate. What it does is it allows you to have all sorts of crazy uh, difficulties and strategies. So let me mention a point where I disagreed with Jean Marsh. What she said was the reason she liked uh, use it or lose it is it meant that somebody who was sitting on something would now have a stronger incentive to sell it into the secondary market. When AT&T sits on something, they're not going to sell it into the secondary market, so that turns out to be perfectly okay. Uh, the basic argument is really exactly the opposite. Um, if, in fact, it is optimal for somebody to keep this thing off, um, you can always get them out of their stupor by paying them money. And if you don't want to pay money now, they hold it. The advantage of allowing somebody to hold it is that AT&T at a later date is going to have to bid against other people. And there's no guarantee that a premature market will get you a more accurate use than anything else. I also would add that when you're dealing with these cases, spectrum use is very complicated. And even though you may not want to build out the spectrum in which you generate power with respect to it, you can certainly lease out that spectrum during the period of interim use so that somebody else can transmit over your spectrum. Many people refer to the light square case on which I did a lot of consulting work with respect to the Harbinger situation. And if you had a sort of an efficient system there, the GPS simply could have paid rent to whatever it was that happened to hold the spectrum that was adjacent to its own uh, for using those rights, knowing in effect that those leases could be terminated when, as and if, the landlord decided to put it to more extensive use. The moment you introduce the government to these cases, what you do is you get cancellations at will, which turn out to be devastating. Devastating. And in the case of the Harbinger situation, there were several billion dollars of capital that were essentially wiped out by this particular transaction, coupled with the fact that the deployment of a third network on the scale of both Verizon and AT&T could no longer take place. And this stuff is still wallowing in uncertainty, even though it's now over two years since the FCC decided that it was going to hold things off. 
Now, of course, you're always entitled to run deep investigations to see what's going on in these cases. And in fact, you get legislation which says that you can't even put this thing back into circulation unless you go to congressional committees and do other kinds of reports. So what you do is you see the way in which the political force is completely corrupt, in my view, or the way in which a system would work. If one had followed Ronald Coase's particular views on this system, what would happen is that spectrum would have been sold off. Um, it's a very valuable band. Actually, there are two bands that are involved in the light squared cases. At that point, you could stop interference. It is a difficult concept in some cases because you have to figure out just how much interference you're going to tolerate at the boundary line. But there is no known conception of interference which says that when somebody broadcasts within his own species, his own portion of the spectrum, he is interfering with somebody else who trespasses on that particular space, which is essentially when you strip away all the complications, what is associated with the GPS claim. So that the moment you start to keep these things and use it or lose it, what you do is you flip the property rights over uh, so that it turns out that by saying interference really matters, uh, the guy who owns the property is barred from using his own land so that somebody who has a much lower use under these circumstances could take it. Now, in dealing with this particular issue, one of the things that's striking about the discussion thus far is that nobody has talked about the takings alternative uh, to deal with this particular problem. And this is important in virtually all of the areas that we're starting to talk about. And let me just first indicate how it plays out with respect to the situation that we're talking about with the spectrum, and then go back to the water rights, where, Karen, I think I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit, uh, but in a way which I hope is constructive, unlike my disagreements on the spectrum stuff, where basically my attitude is one of controlled malevolence with respect to the <laughs> dominant authorities who are working in this particular area. Well, we have this situation where a GPS system is extraordinarily valuable. And if, in fact, you think it's more valuable than the light square situation, the condemnation situation is basically a rule just compensation introduces a price system, and the government can now unilaterally force the option to surrender so long as it pays the opportunity cost to somebody else and keep all the surplus associated with the particular gain in question. Uh, it turns out, under these circumstances, the GPS people would never pay um, light squared the value of its spectrum because if you go back and look at the situation, uh, the receivers that they use um, in order to collect information uh, which, in fact, transport over the, uh, the light squared spectrum could be themselves redefined and narrowed in a much more efficient fashion. So the moment you start doing this, it's like that six kind of thing, you know, the six irrigation situation. You know uh, that if you want to take the whole thing, you're going to have to be paying, you know, a billion dollars a year. If you put in the better scuppers, you can knock that down to $100,000 or a million dollars or whatever it is. What the price system does under these circumstances is not only compensate you ex post for the things that happen, but it gives you a strong signal so there'll be no compensation is going to be needed because they won't bother to do the dastardly deed in the first place. And the single most important function of the takings law is not to give compensation for the takings that take place. It's to prevent errant government officials from engaging in kind of takings uh, that, in fact, should never have taken place at all. Now, when I talk about the government as a despoiler, I want you to understand that this is also in the environmental area, every bit as much as it is everywhere else. And so I'm going to mention a case which, when I taught it in water law, literally, again, sent angry spines up my, whatever it is, angry chills up my spine, I guess is a more accurate way to say it. It's a case involving Mildenburg, in which what the United States does is it starts to pollute a relatively sensitive site so that salt water gets diluted, and it turns out that all sorts of wild life die. And the question is whether or not the government has to pay confiscation. First thing you know is that if, in fact, any private party had done this, we would all be screaming, pollution, pollution, pollution. It's the ultimate sin on the face of the globe. How can you ever tolerate these things? And we bring every governmental agency out in order to stop it. But when the government admits the pollution, what you do is you get a judge in the federal court, Judge Garcia, however he pronounces his name, and what does he announce to us? He says, well, everybody knows that the rights of riparians don't include the right to have your water not fouled up by pollution coming from above, which is just flatly wrong with respect to the riparian system, flatly wrong with respect to reasonable uses, flatly wrong with respect to prior appropriation. It's not right anywhere, because in all of these cases, pollution essentially causes harm 
on to traditional forms of property rights. So this is a case in which the takings law supplements and strengthens the way in which the private rights system works and strengthens the way in which these various ecological values are taking place. So you have to make sure that you get it right. Now, with respect to the other situation, uh, if, in fact, we decide, given traditional property rights, that in-stream uses are of greater value than one might have otherwise have thought, there is an appropriate way in which to do this. Rather than redefining property rights, what you do is you put the item on budget. You say what we would like to do is to secure some in-stream uses and figure out the priorities that you have to take from various people in order to do this. Since there's a ready market, more or less, with respect to water, the just compensation for formulas are not going to be completely crazy to deal with. And if it turns out that you create some extra benefits to downstream users, you can treat that as unappropriated water and then sell that off so as to recover some of the costs that are associated in question. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that when you look at the mixture of private rights on the one hand and public rights with respect to the other, don't fear just compensation on the grounds that it's going to put things on the government budget, which it may not want to do. Treat that in many cases as a positive virtue associated with the system, and you can avert the kinds of tragedies that you have in the Mildenberger case and the complete fiasco that has taken place with respect to the light squared case. Now, having said all of that, the question is, how does this exclusivity panel work when you then try to move it over and to deal with some of the questions that are associated with the formation and the organization of water rights? And what I do, in effect, is I start teaching this subject from Roman law, and you say, oh, why is this man doing Roman law? Well, because all of you basically stumbled over your tongues when you used the word usufructory interest. How many of you actually know what it means? Well, it's a Roman law concept. And for those of you who wish to care about its original and pure meaning, a usufruct was basically an alienable life estate in possession with respect to a piece of land. Uh, so I own a piece of land, and it turns out that I have either a relative or somebody else in business who can use it better. What I do is I convey the thing to them. Often it's gratuitous. And the basic rule is they can use it as they please so long as they don't damage the proprietary or what we would call reversionary interest but they are not allowed to sell it off to anybody else unless they get my consent because the basic intuition that they have is any time you have divided interest and you have a sale, you're always worried about the externality if the person whom you choose to use the thing is displaced by somebody else with whom you may not have any kind of natural love or affection. So they require you to go back home. Unlike the English life estates, you cannot have use of fructory interest in remainder because they really don't serve any good. They just gum up the title. So this is a case in which the Romans actually got things very much better, I think, than the Anglo-American law on that particular point. And then the question is, if that's what a usufruct is, why on God's name would anybody want to describe a water interest uh, that anybody has in either a riparian, reasonable user, or prior appropriation system as a usufructory interest? And the answer is, we don't have a better word. Uh, the situation sort of starts as follows. What you do when you try to evaluate the efficiencies of various kinds of legal systems is you never begin the discourse by taking cases that are close, or you're never quite sure of the outcome. So when I started teaching as a torts lawyer, I can give you every case in which the use of a strict liability theory in a stranger case would vary from the use of a negligence theory in a stranger case. And someday one guy came up to me and said, are you the only person in the world who cares about this? And I thought about it and I said, no. I said, every practicing lawyer in court compares about it. But he wasn't thinking about that question. He was saying, if in fact we change from negligence to strict liability with respect, for example, to nuisance law, what's it going to do to the change in the relative value of all parts of land which are subject to one uniform law relative to another? And the answer is the changes turn out to be so small that nobody can detect them in most of these cases. So this is the kind of problem when you actually try to think it through, turns out not to yield a very very clear conclusion one way or the other. And what happens is, therefore, they get up to the top of the appellate system, and everybody's trying to prove out why one law is more efficient than the other. And for each argument, there is an equal and opposite argument that goes the other way. So what you do is you're talking essentially about 1% differences over a system. 
Now, when you take big questions, you don't get 1% differences. You get very big differences. And so let me give you an illustration. Let's just start with the choice between land and water before we start talking about choices amongst water regimes. And the first of these choices is somebody comes up and says, I've got this brilliant idea. We'll experiment, and we'll use the land system for water and the water system for land. We'll just simply flip them over. Because after all, everybody knows that private property systems are arbitrary, that efficiency really doesn't matter. It's your intuitive, exquisite sense of justice that really counts. And then when you start doing this, the first reaction you have is, are you for real? So you start on the land side, right? And now it turns out that what we do is we have equal access of everybody to the land. Nobody could exclude anybody else. And then, uh, just to quote Karen, um, this is the case where you not only need water, it's nice to have some agriculture here and there. And if, in fact, you do not allow he who sows to reap, you get nothing planted, which is why it was in the original land case they understood that you have to give long-term interest. There was no permanent interest in property until there was agriculture because nobody cared to make any kind of investment in it. Adam Smith figured that out by just being a smart guy, which he certainly was, and subsequent work by evolutionary psychologists and God knows, anthropologists and so forth, have all confirmed that essentially if you are basically a hunter-gatherer society, you don't make permanent investments in land, you know what traditional models of property are with respect to the chattels that you have and so forth, but your land, you glide through it, and you never make a permanent claim because frankly, once you've exhausted it, it's time to move on anyhow. And the real question is who you're going to kill whom when there's only one plot of land which has a lot of stuff to sustain them and two particular tribes and a couple of chimpanzees are fighting over the question of who gets to own it. Uh, so under these particular circumstances, you really have to have it. And if you switch over to the other system, it's not going to be sort of finding a micrometer that can measure the difference. Essentially, civilization will collapse if you try to advance agriculture without having essentially strong systems of property rights and land. It's a big deal. Now you go to water. And you say, well, we flip that over too. So the first thing is you get to a river, whether it's a tiny little river somewhere in England or a medium-sized river. You know, it's like the three little pigs, right? Um, a medium-sized river with parge um, sitting in the eastern part of the United States or the mighty Colorado. And you say, what we're going to do is we're going to say first possession applies to the whole thing. So now everybody dams up a river and everybody downstream starts to go. All the ecological interests disappear because when you're walking about water, what everybody understands is that it really is an extremely complex resource. And it has in-stream uses and outstream uses. And it turns out that if you allow one person to divert it, which is what you allow him to do, if in fact he's occupying land, it's a catastrophe of the first order. So all of us good libertarians, and when I taught this water law class, there were mainly libertarians in the room, they said, Professor Epstein, why have you ruined our view of the world and turned everything upside down? I said, because I want you to understand there's no intuitive theory of property rights. It's simply a question of trying to figure out that system which balances off two major kinds of costs. One of them are externalities, and the others are the cost of coordination. Uh, if you're starting to talk about water and you allow somebody to do it, you'll never get back to the right position. If you start with land and you treat it as collective, you'll never get back to the right position. But in both places, if you get the fir right first approximation, it's a lot easier to get to the final and correct result. So let me just give you two examples uh, with simple water systems before we talk about something having to do with prior appropriation. So if you're going to start talking about the question of land, uh, the paradigmatic tort is nuisance. And nuisances, unfortunately, come in all size, shapes, and quantities. And the standard model is big nuisance causing big harm to a single party. Uh, but if, in fact, you define a nuisance as a physical invasion of noise soot, or something coming from one person's land onto the land of another without the trespass, every time I whisper it in the garden at night, there is a noise nuisance to somebody else. And if it were larger, you'd shut it down. But what we do is we develop a rule of live and let live with respect to these things. And the guy who figured this out, and if you've never read the case, you really ought to, because it's a textbook and intuitive genius. Um, it's a man named Baron Bramwell, a libertarian, who figured out that the live and let live rule was a Pareto improvement in 1862 over the sharp rules with respect to boundaries. And he said, quite simply, this is the kind of rule that if we put it into place from what we now call the ex-ante perspective, it means that everybody will regard himself better off with the alteration of rights than they were with the original division. 
He also noted that if you've got lots of neighbors, it's going to be impossible to do this by voluntary contracts and covenants, so that what we do is we have a forced exchange of rights, which becomes part of the settled expectations that nobody thinks twice about it, because that's how dominant the system is. And with respect to land, you're always making various kinds of corrections when you see inefficiencies. So if you don't have airplanes, the ad coilum rule is absolutely wonderful. Might as well go all the way up to the top. Whom you're harboring? You get airplanes. Well, do you really think everybody's better off if you have to buy licenses from 4 million people in order to file 20 miles? And the answer turns out to be no. So what we do is we announce that the upper spaces are now free space for everybody to go. Well, that's not going to work. So we create property rights and highways up there, and we run it through something like the FDA, and everybody regards themselves as the better, and nobody pays any explicit compensation. So that one essential part of the basic theory is when you're forcing one party to bear huge losses by the actions of another, for example, the government in that wretched Mildenberg case, uh, what happens is you require compensation. But if, in fact, the benefits that the statute or the common law change does are uniformly distributed across the population without compensation, you don't want to waste the money to make transfer payments back and forth from everybody to everybody else, which achieves no allocative gain. You only have just compensation that is paid when you can find some gain to the social system by putting it in place, and that is by no means a universal condition. So when I wrote my book on takings, I announced that all the world's a taking, and then took back half of it in the form of implicit in-kind compensation. And the key thing to understand is that you get different results if you have comprehensive takings and implicit in-kind compensation than if you take the ridiculous position that was adopted by the United States Supreme Court, which insisted that property rights and land consist only of the right to exclude, so that all rights with respect to use and development, for example, are essentially in public solution subject to government veto. Uh, that one set of rules, starting with Justice Brennan in the situation that we had in Penn Central, was a catastrophe, and it was continued, oddly enough, uh, when they decided cases in which they awarded compensation, Kaiser Etne, uh, that exclusivity is the hallmark of property. It isn't the hallmark of property. It is one essential element of property, but property is a system and it's not a single attribute one way or the other. So that with respect to the land cases, essentially what happens is exclusivity is then modeled and modified. Now, when it comes to water, we do exactly the same thing, only we stop from the opposite side of the situation. So if you go back and you start to read our good friend John Locke, he essentially does not understand how property systems work. Um, he makes several mistakes, even though he has lots of good intuitions. The first one is to assume that the rule with respect to the acquisition of things depends upon a labor theory of value. Uh, there is no labor theory of value in classic English common law or in classic Roman law. It is simply a rule of first possession. And the last thing you want to do is to make people work very hard to get something which they can take by just picking it up and expend no labor at all. That labor becomes a waste. There's no reason to use it because you could identify who owns the particular thing simply by seeing who owns possession of it. And then if you're a good common lawyer or a good Roman lawyer, you spend oodles of time figuring out how it is that you don't lose possession when you put something down in order to go out and to get something else. And so the doctrine of possession becomes essentially the major feature of discussion in both Roman law and in English law because you must make an efficient adjustment, i.e., if you take something that's yours before you, until you abandon it, the fact that you let go of it and keep it in your house doesn't mean it now returns to a state of nature. And that rule itself, the stability of possession, as it came to be called by David Hume, who himself was trained as a Roman lawyer, indicates one of the great achievements, widely unnoticed today, but absolutely essential to the fabric of our system. So when you get to water rights, what do you do? Well, it turns out everybody here has talked about in-stream rights, and they've talked about out-of-stream rights. And the question is, what's the appropriate way to deal with it? If your name is John Locke, you start talking about uh, a prohibition against waste, which sounds very much like the doctrine of beneficial use with respect to Western water, and the so-called famous Locke improviso. Everybody must leave as much again and as good as the common when they start taking something out for private rights. Both of these things are complete nightmares because the man doesn't understand how systems are put together, not that you would expect them to since he's writing in 1682, publishing in 1690. And what's the problem? Essentially, the question here is trying to create equality of social welfare at the margin. And what do we mean by that particular phrase? 
Well, every time you take a drop of water out of a river, there's one drop less for public uses and one more drop for private uses, right? Now, suppose for the first drop, what we do is we construct a schedule and we say, you know, that's the drop that keeps us from drowning or starving or whatever it is, rather, you know, dying of thirst. Well, if that's the case, we'll take it because it's not going to do much to the river and it's going to do a lot more for me. Well, you keep on going down the number of drops that you have, right? And sooner or later, you'll come to the point where you've got a lot of water that's out in the system and much less water in the system. And after a while, you come to the judgment that the in-stream losses exceed the out-of-stream gains. This has nothing to do with the question of whether or not you're wasting the water because the definition of waste is not do you have more use for the water then the stream has use for the water, or the in-stream uses of value, it simply does the use exceed zero. And that's too weak a constraint in order to get you into the right place in mind. And so that's the first one. And then do you ever leave as much again and as good in the commons? Well, you never do, because you always took out the best thing first. So by definition, so long as there's scarcity, the lock in proviso means that nobody can take anything, and you're missing all the marginal gains. So what the riparian system did, and which the prior appropriation system cannot do, is it said, look, we are going to allow aggregate removals from the river of that quantity of water, which, as an educated guess, we think are more valuable in private uses, domestic uses, agricultural uses, animal uses, and so forth, without wrecking the river. How do we get there? Well, we're not really sure. And we may need some centralized authority to look over it, but at least we know what we're looking for. And when we go too far in one direction or too far in the other direction, there are going to be natural corrective responses. Well, that's the first question. And you solve it pretty well. Then you get the second question. Who gets it? And as all of you noted, the riparian system never uses the system of strict priority. Because you never know who comes to the river first, or second, or third. Now, lots of stuff is flowing by. And whereas it's not very smart to take your cows to the edge of the Grand Canyon in order to them sip water out of the Colorado River, uh, it's rather different when you're talking about an English stream or a small river where you can have your animals go to the river, lick up a little bit of water, go back fat, happy, and contented, and produce nice calves for you to consume in one fashion or the other. And so what you do, in effect, is you have a pro rata system and a hierarchy of uses. And you don't make these things transferable because of the dangers that are associated with the fact that if you could start to sell these water rights, you will simply expand the amount of water that's taken out of the river. So in order to keep the river in its integral state, what you do is you have certain inefficiencies associated with the alienation of these rights, which can now only be transferred with the land in question. And this is an absolutely brilliant system. You come to riparian systems in Colorado, I don't know how many of you have read or read recently uh, the great case of Coffin against the left-hand ditch company. But if you've never read it, go back and read it in Six Colorado, because it is one of the most clear acknowledgment prior to the time when anyone even knew what the word efficiency or social welfare meant, of guys understanding exactly what's at stake. And what essentially is there was water on the Rain River, or some such name, Right? Same for rain. Right? You actually know what it is, right? And I don't. <laughs> and you get two competitors. You have the guy who owns a little bit of surface lands by that uh, particular stream who claims is a riparian. And then you have this other fellow who put into place a lot of locks. And the court, of course, is very careful to explain all the various kinds of devices that he used to take the water from here to there to the other place and makes it very clear that he took it over the rise, the property used on the other side of a slope. And the reason the court does that is if you do this as a riparian, it's essentially not permissible. And so the question is whether or not when it turns out that the riparian decides to bust up the various kinds of facilities that were built by the other guy, whether the action in trespass was justified by a protection of property, this wonderful common law acts. And these guys, they are basically pure aggregate utilitarians, and I'll explain to you why they're right here and wrong if you carry it over. What they say is there are thousands upon thousands of acres of land which depends upon these ditches and these canals and whatever else we happen to build. And there's this one puny son of a gun who's sitting there who may well have 
Oh, it's not going to take 10 minutes. Um, um, I met one fellow son of a gun sitting out there who wants to stop the whole thing. And frankly, we know how to compare millions upon millions of dollars of gain against $10 of gain on the other side. And so they use the phrase imperative necessity to say they're wiping it out. Now, what would we do today? We would call this a very obvious call to Hicks improvement. Uh, what you call the Hicks is that form of social welfare uh, that says if, in fact, the gains to the winners are so large that they could pay compensation to the losers, we allow them to do it, if we're certain about this, even if the compensation is not paid. There is no more dangerous doctrine in the world than doing that as a first approximation. But like all things, it depends on how much the trade-off is. If you're trying to say that the guy who wrecks 20 doesn't have to pay 19 to somebody else, measurement errors will make this doctrine into a complete nightmare. But if you're talking about millions upon millions, you're doing it as a general rule. There's no political infrastructure. There's no kind of public choice problem that Ray Gifford referred to earlier on in the questions. Well, at this particular point, well, of course you do it, and you assume that the guy who owns that little sliver of land will prosper by virtue of the fact that his property will increase in value by some minuscule amount or more to offset the by virtue of the general improvement to the community, which will offset his losses. And so the Hayekian principle, which I think is the correct one, is you normally want just compensation to make everything a strong improvement where everybody's better off and nobody's better off. But if the disparity comes to the level that we're talking about, we are talking about 100 to 1 ratios, we don't want to play that game anymore. We'll go the other way. Will there be cases in the middle? Yes, and they won't be very important. The key cases on this are the move from riparianism to prior appropriation. Because you know if you flip the two systems over and use prior appropriation in England, and if it turned out you use English riparianism in Colorado, it would be a disaster both ways around. So what does this then start to tell you? It starts to tell you that when you start to put these systems together, the things that you really have to worry about are those things whose aggregate consequences are so large that you do not need any kind of deep private empirical study in order to be able to verify. What you need to do is to have people who have some kind of situation sense who can start to tell you this. Now, why is it that I say this? Because this is, in fact, in some sense, a deep declaration against interest. Um, if you look around this room, virtually every one of you, I, I don't know how to describe it, but I've had 40 years with minerals, 30 years with oil and gas, 50 years with water. Uh, you all are specialists in your own area. Uh, you may not be deep theoreticians, uh, which is probably an advantage on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but what happens is you certainly know the empirical magnitudes of the trade-off, and it allows you, when you start talking about these things, to have a common empirical framework, which means that you can actually make sense one to another. The difficulty about being an academic, unless you get your hands dirty in one shape or another, is that what you tend not to do is to understand the magnitude of the consequences that come with different kinds of shifts. And you often underestimate those that really matter and overestimate those that don't. Why is it that academic lawyers make this mistake? Because they start at the wrong end of the process. They start with the appellate case, which manages to weave itself up through the system rather than starting with the routine transaction on which everybody is going to either live or die. And so the moment you do this, there is a theorem um, called the 50-50 theorem uh, divided by George Priest and Ben Klein in the Journal of Legal Studies in 1984. I'm privileged enough to have been the editor who actually selected that argument, that paper, and published it. It's immensely influential. And what it says is that you're most likely in symmetrical state cases, where the odds are the same on both sides, to have those cases to go up to the top where the odds are 50-50. And that means, in fact, it's really very close because you don't have strong empirical intuitions. So if the question is whether you use a strict liability or negligence plus res ipsa loquitur to handle your product liability cases, none of you have a clue which way ought that to come out. The authorities start to differ one way or another. And in fact, if you actually take the history before they change the definition of defect between, say, 1944 and 1962, I worked for the insurance industry when the whole system blew up. And they said, oh, 18 years, we didn't even bother to charge premiums. We didn't care about strict liability. Nothing happened either way. 
On the other hand, when you got rid of the open and obvious rule, which none of you have ever heard about, so that a machine tool which presented a perfectly clear danger could now be dangerous, it meant that every machine tool sold in the United States from 1900 to 1970 was now fair game, because you could never get summary judgment as a defendant. And all of a sudden, these guys are sitting there with a massive insurance crisis, and they hired me when I was 33 years of age, and they said, Professor, we have no idea what the hell hit us. Can you figure out what happened? And they kept on talking about negligence and strict liability. And at that point, I said, no, you can't take something that that's close and get that kind of difference. And so we went back to the definition of defect and the definition of open and obvious. And by once you overturn those two particular stones, you all sorts of very funny creatures started crawling out from underneath the rock, which explained the changes that happened. And it's exactly the same thing that goes. So now, what is it that we then have to do? Well, in these three particular areas, as I said, you're going to have all kinds of middle size, small size, large size problems. The first thing that you need to do in each and every case is to get the relative magnitudes correctly. And then with respect to the small stuff, you leave it to the lawyers, right? Remember, where's Rob? Are you sitting over there, right? Uh, but for the big stuff, you want to get some other solution with your basic position. And it turns out you do need to get a workable definition of interference. And if you take the light square definition of interference as championed by the GPS, you have a social catastrophe of the worst order. If you're trying to figure out what the noise to signal ratio ought to be in conventional senses of this, what you do is you have a nice technical dispute which can be handled one way or another. So the little final lesson that I'm going to leave you with is that the advantage of studying everything and knowing nothing particularly well, having gone back and forth across all of these systems, is it kind of gives you a sense of world perspective in which you see the same kinds of structural issues that arise in all sorts of areas that don't seem to give you the same kinds of problems. And essentially, the task that you face is really can be put in one ugly sentence. Can you monetize the difference in the change of legal structures from one to the other? And you have to think about it very carefully. If you can't figure out how to monetize it, you don't worry about it as a grand political issue. If you can figure out how to monetize it, then you really have to worry about what the optimal choice of rule is. How do you handle these things? Well, in general, if you've got contract solution available, you want those. If it turns out that you're talking about property rights, uh, you would like them to be essentially strong in the connection with resources for which exclusive development is appropriate, so that land and minerals, right, now start to look like the spectrum, and they all look the same way. But if you remember in the first panel when we started talking about oil and gas, somebody said, hey, that stuff is fugacious. Well. The answer is that makes all the difference in the world because now when you start drilling, you're drilling other people's oil. And in fact, you need a legislative solution. And the reason why that field turned out as well as it did is after many false starts, the unitization systems, the well-spreading systems, the pooling systems that were developed were textbook perfect to respect the initial allocations of value to the various surface owners while improving the size of the take. The same thing happens with respect to the fishery. If you use the wrong system to handle the common pool problem, what you do is you improve it by 5%. You use the right system, uh, you can produce it by 50 or 100%. So the big institutional design questions are what I want to leave you with. And the great feature about this particular conference is that it gave you a very nice opportunity to see how this particular dynamic played out across all these particular areas. So at this point, I have reached my time limit, right? I will now wrap up. I will not take the two minutes. What I will do is exceed it back to the common pool and allocate it to that person who asks a question first. So thank you all. Mm. So I think you all get to see what a delightful speaker Richard is. Thought-provoking as always. Obnoxious as usual. And I would say he had no notes, but he had some illegible notes here. So it's not quite no notes, but it's close. I didn't use them. He didn't use them. <laughs> um, not only that, I can't read them. <laughs> so I, I want to um, encourage all of you to stay for a reception uh, and some students. I'll take questions. You want to take some questions? Of all right. course. <laughs> all right. First question from a student. We'll come to it. So, come on, we got some twos in the back there. Yeah, come on, guys. Joe Lee, you're going to take it? Yes, thank you, dear. She's driving to the airport tomorrow, too. So. That's okay. Woo!
Professor Epstein, thanks for being here. Um, you mentioned at the beginning um, an issue that maybe wasn't touched upon in the panels as much as you thought was uh, was necessary maybe with the use it or lose it regime encouraging maybe overdevelopment or fast <laughs> development of particular resources when maybe it's necessary to sit on those for a while. Um, and I'm wondering what you think about that issue with the recent boom in unconventional oil and gas development in Colorado and how you think. Oh, I mean the fracking issue, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. well look, let, let me, let's start from the beginning. Use it or lose it is an efficient contractual device when they're divided interest because otherwise the conflict of interest really take over. Uh, the question with fracking is do you or do you not see those interests? You certainly don't see them with respect to the land leases. The question with fracking is a very different question, which is if you intensify the process, what does it do with respect to externalities of a nuisance-like behavior? And my view about nuisance law is pretty much the same as it was in the 12th century. Um, physical invasion of somebody else's water supply, even when done by private parties, ought to be actionable. And then the question is what's the choice of remedy? Nuisance law, that becomes the central question. And the first choice about this is do you go ex ante or do you go ex post? And there's a divided answer to it. You do not go, at least with fracking in my judgment, ex ante, where you stop it in its entirety. What you do is you follow the common law rule on this, which is if somebody's engaged in fracking and somebody senses that something is wrong, then they can basically seek to enjoy the opportunity and make the guy drop dead quite literally. Um, if it turns out that there's an imminent threat or some actual harm. And the reason you have that no mercy rule is because smart owners will always steer away from the abyss and back off a little bit, so the probability of this particular occurrence would be very, very small. The last thing you want to do is to have a permit system which says, we're going to imagine a thousand different things that can possibly go wrong. You have to explain to us each and every one of them and how you deal with it. And by the way, I, you know, talk is cheap. I've mentioned a hundred. I now go out and form another rah-rah section. Bold is not a bad place to have it. And you now find another hundred reasons that you can do. And what you do is you manage to magnify highly low probability events into make it or break it with respect to deals. Not good. So the first thing is the ex ante stuff. The second thing is the ex post stuff. And if it turns out that the ex ante doesn't work, you give serious damages based upon the actual and consequential losses associated with because you don't want to have just one string in your barrel. Now, the third feature to understand is the most important. It's the dynamic feature. That is, if you go to the early days of fracking, uh, the number of mishaps was rather substantial, often because of plain dumb practices, sometimes even with best practices. But these are industries that evolve extremely quickly. And one of the reasons why you don't want to have the ban is it prevents adaptations that take place by constant use. So if you want to figure out how to do nuclear power, if you just had America here, we haven't done anything in this field since 1977. But the French, of all people, the French, right? They're running 70 on nuclear power plants without a hitch, and theirs is the technology that you want. You don't want to keep old nuclear plants in business. You want to get them out by putting new ones in. And in fact, the greatest and the single most expensive word in the environmental lexicon is the word new. What I mean by that is we put very heavy taxes on new developments, which grandfathers and protects older developments, which are vastly more inefficient. The ratio of losses in many cases is 1,000 to 1. And these are simply unforgivable kinds of things. Uh, you don't want to give people an exogenous and stupid reason to keep a bad plant alive, and you're doing exactly that when it goes the other way. So what you want to do, in effect, is to have an output tax on pollution, for example, which means that the old plants will be retired. When the new plants come on, these guys can multiply, and they will get you orders of magnitude improvement. Um, because of the gap in time and so forth. So what you're talking about is really a question of remedial design to deal with the externality problem. You're not talking about the problem of either indefinite property rights over time or the question of how you form an optimal lease. And that's a great note topic. You can talk more tomorrow morning. Talk to uh, Professor Kramer, too. Um, Lee, you want to go first? And then first. Um, you know, Richard, um, whenever you're thinking about Whenever we're thinking about property rights frontiers, mm -hmm. uh, which is the case with land, let's take the Arctic, uh, 
water, spectrum, minerals, there's going to be a race for property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mostly talked about property rights in a comparative context. Yeah. And you didn't discuss a lot of the trade-offs in terms of gains for prospecting, in terms of dissipation of too many oil wells right. and so on, uh, in the race for property rights on frontiers. Uh, could you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, this is an absolutely vital question. Let's go back to the non-frontier <coughs> case, and then we'll go to the Sooners, all right? Uh, the first possession rule is not a rule that comes from heaven. It's a rule which comes from Gaius and from Justinian, and it applied in a time in which essentially the diffusion of people to the frontier was done at a very slow rate. And it also was the case at that time uh, that if you took too much possession, you couldn't protect it from the animals. If you took too much possession, you were too far from your neighbors. Uh, so that what happened is there were nice ways in which you could kind of get moderate, squarish kinds of plots. And then you'd worry about infrastructure and roads coming on in there. And the system worked pretty well under that case. But when you start switching context, there's nothing which guarantees it. Uh, so if you remember who the Oklahoma Sooners are, they're in that state which is not too far from here. What happened is they decided they were going to have a first possession rule which would allow people to recover 160 acres of land. So they had a distributional constraint, right? Uh, but what they then did is they ran the situation. Well, the Sooners were the guys who cheated on the boundary line. And if, in fact, you ran this as a race, it would be a complete melee because everybody would come to the same land at about the same time. And even though the first possession rule is expressed in ordinal fashion, the cardinality, i.e. the size of the actual differences, manages to make a huge difference. And so for that situation, they should have used an auction um, to handle the thing because you could then identify the plots of land, have people go out and inspect it at their leisure, and then have them put in the bids just the way when you run an art auction what you do is you put the lots up for inspection beforehand, and then you have the bidding. And when you use the medical matching system, you allow people to interview before you run the match. So it's not like it is with law clerkships, the first possession question, right? Uh, which coffee do you take? Well, I give you three minutes to decide. Well, this other guy, yeah, crazy stuff, right? And so when you get to the spectrum, you know, you can occupy the whole spectrum in a matter of a second or less, right? To use a first possession rule there is bizarro in the extreme. So what you need for the government to do is to design a system of property rights that gives you blocks which have the following two characteristics. They have to be big enough to be usable and not so big as to create huge monopoly impediments. So you're trying to find exactly the, you know, the soup bowl that you're going to use that's not too hot and not too cold. And once you get the basic structure, you've gotten the big problem right. The small problem is trying to figure out exactly which way you configure these things, how big a band you want and why. And at that point, you actually listen to industry people. Because if you're going to use signal at the boundary lines and you make them too narrow, two small curves overlapping with an extra boundary line in them is hugely small than a higher curve with that. And so what you do is you see people wanting medium-sized stuff, and then the real bidding question is how you acquire adjacent spectrum, which allows you to get these things, subject, in my view, to an antitrust constraint. So I think you have to be very aware of this particular kind of problem, because every rule is a trade-off. And if you can go too fast, you can go too slow. And if you don't have the institutional texture, you'll never be able to get it right. And as you know, when they try to work this thing out in 1926, uh, they had the worst of all possible systems. They had a limited band of spectrum that was to be allocated uh, to broadcast use, and there was nobody who had the power to figure out who got where first at any given time. So in 1920, it worked fine because there was only one station in Pittsburgh. By 1923, oi! Oh, the whole thing, so it's not 26, rather. It goes crazy. And who comes in? The great kleptocrat himself, Herbert Hoover, um, who says, well, I'll solve this problem. I'll just take it, and I'll make my own system of allocation. And of that, public interest, necessity, and convenience is born, and the auction essentially dies until Coase managed to revise it in 1959. And I can't even remember his name, but my, there was a Chicago student in 1950. Yes, yes, Leo Herzl. Or Herzl had done it in 1951. You know, this and student is, note, by the way, Julie, yeah, for inspiration. Note. Student note, right? Look, this is in fact, you know, these are cosmic errors, just errors beyond all compare. And the best modern commentator on this is Tom Hazlett. I mean, uh, and what you do is this is an area in which you have to write angry because there's such enormous losses. It's not like one of these really exquisite balancing cases 
where you can write sober. Now, there's another question? Yeah, final question, Bruce. Uh, one of the topics was mentioned by a number of the speakers was mm -hmm. the speculative poverty and the desire to avoid speculative profits. How does that fit into your system of well, things. the answer is, what's wrong with speculative profits? In fact, I mean, you get exactly the same problem you get with respect to theater tickets. Um, if I price the thing too well, and my seasoned subscribers have it, so we want to say they could only give it to their distant mother-in-law, they could sell it to a total stranger for twice the price. And if you're trying to figure out what the sum of revealed preferences are, what the speculator is, is a responsible middleman who gets things to higher rather than lower value uses. And so the only time you start worrying about speculation is if somehow or other when you put the thing in the hands of somebody, he will so twist and convert the asset into something other than it was uh, that you're not reselling the thing that you happen to have. And there are certain kinds of rights which may be temporally bound, um, uh, which may have those kinds of characteristics. Uh, but generally speaking, if there's a well-organized market at the back end, uh, the speculator ceases to be a problem. You remember all of this came up with respect to the oil spikes one way or another, and everybody started to figure out what was going to happen with respect to the manipulation, and nobody could come up with anything. And so what happens is we now have a theory that markets fail when prices go up and markets succeed when prices go down, which is perhaps the worst single theory uh, that you could possibly have with respect to any single kind of resources. So what you really want to do on this thing is to take a snooze and, and not to worry about it. It's a little bit, to give you the other alternative, which is like this, it's the predation model, right? I mean, I could construct an elaborate theory which in one time in a million may show how predation works, but this is just not a serious problem. The serious problem in antitrust law is collusion. And if you treat pollution, if you treat um, predation and collusion as both being antitrust violations that fall under Section 1, it means you don't know what you're talking about. And the hard cases are the vertical integration cases because there are always efficiencies that are associated with uh, the double marginalization problem, which really matter, but there can be a cat's paw kind of operation in which you could conceal horizontal stuff through a vertical stuff. And in some rare cases where you have really powerful stuff, there may well be a monopolization problem that exists in the vertical universe, but it's a second order question. So you rank the things in order, and if you're running the antitrust division, you start with the uh, horizontal stuff, you think a little bit about the vertical stuff. Microsoft case is one example where they managed to mess it up by the time they got done and killed a great company. And then with predation, you just don't care about it. Well, speculation, predation, sign it up. Thank you.